the box seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Hi everyone, welcome to this edition of Your Box Seat, a very special box seat brought to you by our stable of sponsors. It is of course Grand Prix Week amongst other things, the Inter Dominion's on as well. That means Michael Guerin's not in the house, someone who is though is Matthew Cross. Uh, Matt, thanks so much for being part of this week's box seat, an exciting week leading into Sunday at Addington. It's totally different, isn't it, Greg? We had this huge build-up towards Cup Week and then Cup Week was here and it's gone and normally post that we all relax and, and take the suits off and, and not really worry about too much before Christmas. But this has kind of crept up on us. But what a thrilling day we've got ahead. I think in terms of the depth of the race day, this is maybe even better than what we saw during the Harness Jewels days or even on Cup Day or Show Day in terms of the, the consistency of great racing. Cracking fields and it all comes to a head, Greg, on... Sunday, and I'm sure there'll be a few people jumping on course as well. So really looking forward to delving into that with you today. Yeah, more Group 1s on this day than the entire Cup week with eight of them. Let's summarise what we've got for you. The Sunshine Stars New Zealand Derby is the race we're going to start with because it's $250,000 and it has... Uh, potentially going to be one of the great races on the day. New Zealand Pacing Oaks there, uh, the Livermore Trotting Free For All and the Trotting Derby and then we get into the old jewels races, the aces if you like, the hearts, the clubs, the diamonds, the spades and we cap it all off in the final race with the New Zealand Free For All winner in Self Assured taking on the likes of BD Joe and his stablemate in Spankham. So an exceptional race day, $250,000 Group 1 glory on the line in the New Zealand Pacing Derby with Sunshine Stars, the new sales of course to be held at the Magic Millions Complex uh, on the 11th and 12th of March next year. Let's go back to the key lead up race, it was the Ian Dobson Classic these two horses, Akuta and Republican Party going to war Beach Ball ducking to the inside we'll hear from all of those connections as they build towards the derby this was a classic finish. Up to Republican Party, then Beach Ball. Akuta put his head in front from Republican Party, who's coming again. They hit it. I'm staying out of that. It's a close photo. Republican Party or Akuta. Blair, another step for him tonight? Yeah, definitely, Greg. Um, look, he got across easy enough. And, and then when Mark decided to go back early and not come out, I changed tack and went forward. So, you know, he's dug hard to the line. It was a quick last half, and overall time was, was good. They can go a lot quicker, these horses, so therefore, do you think it'll knock them at all? No, Cran City probably did need a, a run tonight, so um, yeah, that, that should top them off nicely for next week. What about going into the derby? Is it crucial you draw inside a cooter, or do you believe that he's well enough rounded now that he could come from off the pace? Yeah, look, I think the way things went tonight with Mark getting so close and I think he may have even headed me, um, it probably is going to be crucial in a way to draw inside him. Um, yeah, they're two very, very good horses and you know it just shows you can't give a horse like that a head start. Well, that was a good battle. It was, yeah. I was head and head right to the line, Greg. But uh, yeah, I, th I thought I had him there for a bit, but he just he kept kept trying Republican Party and just got me. Yep. Going forward to the Derby, though, I mean the barrier draw is going to be obviously crucial. But you feel like you've, you're going to have this horse at absolute peak next week? Yes, he, he thrives between races, Greg. And I thought even just coming in tonight, he he'd done so well after the Cup that uh, perhaps the runner do him good, and I, I think it will. Pretty solid performance. Yeah, happy Greg. Obviously, it's um, something a little bit different from tonight. Obviously, it's something he hasn't done a lot of running behind, but you know, leading into you know the big race next week, I thought it'd be a nice opportunity. And you know, Blair coming, I thought it was the right one to follow. So, the, the quick half doesn't suit him. Like you say, he's not going to make up a lot of ground, but nothing run past him. Just the two that were in front of him. So, you know, I think that's in, you know another run under his belt. It'll, it'll tighten him up nicely for next week. And you know, I think next week if we get another nice draw and he's able to dictate, you know, it might be um, might be catch me if you can. Well, as we now know, he has come up with a beautiful draw. The 109th running of the Sunshine Stars New Zealand Derby, Matthew, and barrier draw-wise, it just about couldn't have worked out better. Beach ball in two, Republican Party in four, not so much for Akuta in eight, but how do you see the early burn and what's likely to unfold and who's going to land in front? Well, you're right about both Beach Ball and Republican Party are likely to go forward. Beach Ball's best option would be to clear the one horse. And 
they might even have a bit of a burn to the first corner and, and have a crack at leading for the first part of the race. But I do think Republican Party will work forward. And if he's in front, <clears throat> I couldn't see him handing, to be quite fair, Greg. Mark Purden's probably got a bit of a job to do from where he's drawn out wide. But one thing about the 2,600 metre starting point is it's much easier to get across from a wide barrier draw over 2,600 than what it is for the 1980. I often find that horses drawn the inside over 2,600 really struggle to hold up if that pressure comes from wide out, whereas the 1980 is totally different. I couldn't see Mark Purden pushing the button early and trying to cross them, but he's going to have to get into the race at some point. It's quite a round horse sometimes, Greg, is, is a cooter. He carries his condition very well. So I do think that that run's really going to bring him on. To compare them both, I know that Akuta's last mile on both Stride Master and the Ultimate Racebook was, was better than Republican Party, but Republican Party sort of absorbed about 10 lengths more in pressure at the start of the race. So they, they were equally as good, and I love how they both fought to the line. Doesn't Mark Purden love a good battle? I know that he often wins the Group 1 races quite comfortably, but he's... He's always a, a great man for a good battle, and I'm sure that he's enjoying the, the ride for both Republican Party and Akuta at the moment. Not much between them, Greg. For me, I think Akuta, the 2,600, is really going to suit him with that run under his belt, so I might just sway a little bit toward him. He's a proper horse, Republican Party. Yep, he definitely is. I'm with Akuta as well, and you're right, sectionally, uh, time equivalent on the Ultimate Racebook. Uh, he went about 2.18, which is inside... Uh, ultimate Snipers 219 New Zealand record. I know it's not exactly that, but it just shows you how well he went. 151.5 time equivalent his, uh, his last mile. OK, so you've gone a cooter, I've gone a cooter. Here's a look at the market. Pre-barrier draw, they were both $2.30. Now we find a cooter, 220 Republican Party, 230 uh, And then you've got Beach Ball at $11. Do you see money coming for Republican Party, or do you think the wave of support for the Mark Purden Hayden Cullen All Star Band may see him even shorter and get to flip of the coin. Well, you know as well as I do, Greg. Big days. Mark Purden Hayden Cullen, if they roll out and um, win, say, two or three Group Ones before a coup, so then the flood of money will just roll in for him. So there's the likelihood that he could shorten, but Republican Party might shorten up a little bit as well. They do probably look the, the two deserved favourites. Beach Ball's a good horse. He's a really good horse. Whether it's come up at the right time for him to be winning a derby, I'm not sure, Greg. I thought Frank Hemendy was better the other night, but he's probably got to lift a little bit even more. And then in behind those, you've got Wheels of Fortune, who's obviously very progressive, maybe just not quite hardened against these sort of horses. And Nicholas Cage wasn't actually the worst run the other night from the second row, and I think the 2,600 will will really suit him. But is that fair to say, Greg, if Mark Purden comes out and drives three winners before a cooter, then he could start shorter than $3. Yeah, well, start. certainly the, the multis will start playing and, and playing a part in where he settles market-wise. So, uh, yeah, it might be crucial as we go through the preview of some of these other races. Uh, if they do start to get on that roll, he may well shorten <coughs> significantly. Looking forward to the 109th running of... The great race, the derby for the three-year-olds. And, yeah, we've got a decent sort of uh, underbelly, if you like, to the field too. So it might not just be as simple as those three, but most thinking it will be. Let's move on to the 73rd running of the IRT New Zealand Oaks. Here's the key lead-up a run here. We'll get to Natalie Rasmussen post-race. Lady of the Light was excellent, Morris McKendry and Jeremy Young. But it was the five-time Group 1 winner getting the business done again. True fantasy, the outside with a narrow lead, Lady of the Light trying to come again, then Coachella, True Fantasy, Lady of the Light's lifting the inside, they come to it, True Fantasy, True Fantasy wanted a nose, but Lady of the Light was oh so brave. Well, we knew she was back in the Neverly R, and that tonight was a pretty soft win for her. It was a good win, Greg. Um, she probably just, we haven't done too much with her between Cup Day and, and now, so she probably just needed the run again tonight, but I'm sure she'll be a lot sharper again come, come Sunday week. Yeah, look, she's already racked up five Group 1 wins, and the Grand Prix Day is going to be a big day, and she, over the Oaks distance, we know how good a star she is. That's right, Greg, yeah, I think too, and, you know, they always go hard in them races, so, you know, hey, she'll be in there with a chance. I thought the horse that ran second tonight was very impressive too, though. She did a lot of work, and she still rallied, but, you know, True Fantasy's in a good place, and she's just a good little filly.
Well, she was $2.20 pre-barrier draw, Matthew. She's come up with uh, barrier one. She's come up a dollar and 55 cents. Uh, we'll have a look at that market in a moment. Is barrier one an advantage, though? She's never shown enormous gate speed. And judging by what you said about the 2,600 metre start point, it's not always as easy to lead from the inside. It's not. She's got enough pace to, I think, at least dictate early. And there's probably nothing on the front row that you're handing to at the start. So Natalie has the potential that she might have to do a little bit of work to hold her spot early. I think the horse that holds the key to the race, Greg, is the horse that we saw run second there in Lady of the Light. Now, with the scratching, she's going to come into two the second row following up firmly Blackbird. And another thing about the 2,600 metre starting point, say six of the nine horses off the front go back, Lady of the Light could settle fourth or fifth to the first corner. I don't think Morris McKendry will be posying up in the 1-1 one, one throughout. He'll be out and around. He'll press on. And I reckon the top's there for Lady of the Light. If True Fantasy is in front, I think she'll hand to Lady of the Light. And therefore, that puts Lady in the Light in a very good position to actually win the race. She's done all of the donkey work in that particular affair last time out and was as brave as true fantasy to the line. The key will be for Lady of the Light's chances, a good cart through early, and then Morris McKendry with a positive drive, which I'd say is a 90% chance to happen, get around. And I think true fantasy, if she has to just do that little bit of work to hold up early to the first corner, Natalie Rasmussen will see her coming around. And you just heard in that interview there as well that she's got a whole lot of respect for Lady of the Light. Therefore, I give Lady of the Light a strong winning chance in the race, Greg. Queen of Diamonds, not too sure where to place her after her run last time out. At the moment, I think it's between Lady of the Light and True Fantasy. But Queen of Diamonds, where are you at with her? Yeah, look, and the barrier draw hasn't helped her either. Look, it was an unusual run, wasn't it? She appeared to uh, uh, lose the back of the horse in front of her about mm. 400 metres from home, and Mark Purden saying that she didn't really want to come out, so he ended up going in, and then she was unlucky. But, yeah, after galloping on Cup Day 2, it's sort of, yeah, you're not really sure where you're at with her. So um, I'm not liking her from out at Barrier 9. She's $8.50. 155 uh, is the price for True Fantasy. And, again, that may well shorten, depending on what happens earlier in the day and then Lady of the Light at $5.50. Another excellent addition of the New Zealand Oaks over the 2,600 metres. The only thing I would say about True Fantasy and whilst I uh, uh, listen to your theory and, that, and why couldn't it happen Lady of the Light taking the lead, the All-Stars don't very often hand up in Group 1 races so um, that's part of the intrigue around uh, the Oaks this year. Really looking forward to that one. Continuing on with our look at Grand Prix Day with our stable of sponsors of course, Livermole getting in behind the Trotting Derby and also the Trotting Free For All. Here's the lead up from last week, Matthew. The uh, Sundon three-year-old trot, hot to trot in front. Highgrove comes off his back and runs him down. We'll get to John Dunn post-race to hear what he thinks of what has been the benchmark for the three-year-olds throughout the year. Ten in front and Highgrove. Highgrove beat hot to trot. There's a statement. Well, he's back. A lot better tonight. Uh, yeah, he was scratching ahead. We couldn't find nothing wrong with him. Couldn't, couldn't follow his work prior to tonight. And... Uh, yeah, and I was actually pleasing the one thing about tonight, I got, got a good trip, like he uh, got off the gate, he was relaxed in the trail and probably the first time he's properly actually done that, up on the speed and had a nice run and come out and capitalised. Look, he put in a bit of a long one at the top of the straight, must have had you slightly concerned, but he's maturing this horse, isn't he? Yeah, he is, and uh, like I say, six months ago, he would have, would have jumped out of his gear, like it's actually a good effort by the horse, not because it was a long one all right and uh, had me a bit worried. But um, to his credit, he got back going, and um, when he is going, he is a lovely, lo lovely going trotter. Right. So confidence for the horse, confidence for you going towards the Derby. Now you're feeling like you can drive him how you want to. Yeah, I think I can now. Um, staying's normally more distance going to suit. Staying sort of his forte in the past. So uh, now we're back on track. Hopefully, he can go back to being that way. All right, so he's the king of the boys at the moment. Before we get to Matthew Cross's assessment of this race, let's go back to the What the Hill with Woodlands, uh, New Zealand trotting Oaks from last week, and have a look at Congrazia Love. Then we'll get to Sean McCaffrey, get his take on her as she now builds towards uh, this outstanding New Zealand trotting derby this week. Up the inside, Paramount Empress. It's Congrazia Love in front from Hidden Talent and Paramount Empress. Congrazia Love and Morris McKendry won the Trotting Oaks. Congrazia Love in a massive effort. Beat Hidden Talent and third across Paramount Empress. Minnie McGugan ran fourth. 
Well, that was impressive. Yeah, I was impressed, especially halfway down when she kicked again. She did a power of work, and obviously off the draw she was going to be out of it early, but the last half was exceptionally quick, and she's beaten some quality here. Well, we, I was just glad we got around the first corner without any, because there's always, you know, there's a, there's a big margin of trouble off the mobile with some of those trotters, but she got around the corner good, was slapped on the outside, and I thought, well, this is all right, and I knew Morris would go down the back. At Cambridge, he said, if we'd have went down the back, he said, we'd have beat those horses easy. He said, she just keeps going. So... Ten of a home, I, to be honest, I thought if she ran third with the favourite and the other horse in the trail, we'd be doing pretty good. But halfway down, too good. That should encourage you to go around in the derby next week. And on that performance, she certainly can stay. Oh, yeah. It was always the intent that if we went good enough on the first night, we'd, you know, we'd come a long way. Didn't come here for a haircut. Yep. So um, we thought, well, you've got to line up if she goes anywhere near it. But on tonight's run, you know, you could... Be a little bit optimistic you could be in amongst it. I think, as it showed tonight, there's two real good horses and the rest are in a bunch. I'm not saying we're better than the bunch, but I'd like to be in the middle there and in between them. You're not a man who does travel them unless they're good enough to do so, and I don't want to compare this filly at any stage to, say, a sovereignty, but she's starting to get into that sort of conversation on that run tonight, and if she produces that again next week, then that's quite exceptional because it takes a, a big effort from a filly to be able to compete with the boys. Oh, yeah, yeah, they, you know, none of them lay down. But I think the 2,600 will suit her better, even. And by love you, like, he's just a stallion. When, when, you, when you hit the pot of gold on a love you, you know you've got a pot of gold. And, you know, even for the owners tonight, they were getting rowdy in the stand there. I could hear them all over the place. Um, but, you know, for Johnny Taylor that's got a... He, uh, he's got 25 years of breeding out of this and like Love You's just lifted horses here so yeah, we, it's just a big night for the owners and a big night for the horse. The man with the magic mo, Sean McCaffrey, a couple of things to come out of that Matthew and we'll, we'll talk about this in depth this race because it's a great contest. Uh, Sean McCaffrey doesn't need to travel anywhere for a haircut because follically challenged it's not a big deal for him. Um, secondly You'll see the letters on the colours of uh, Congrazia Love, uh, Georgia Brook, they stand for, which is Johnny Taylor's uh, late granddaughter. She wasn't on this earth for too long. And uh, Georgia Brook, he named his broodmare, his first broodmare, uh, Georgia Brook, who's left Bollinger. And, uh, you know, I think he sold for a couple hundred thousand at the yearling sales. There's a whole different story in behind this horse. And the, all the people involved in it are Cambridge based owners. Uh, they're just having a, a whale of a time uh, with her. And Sean knows his way around a, a very good horse and he's got one here in Congrazia Love. Yeah, I love that. Uh, we've, we see it with the Blair Vining colours as well from the, the Greg Manson stable. It's always a, a nice way to remember people that sadly are, are no longer with us and what a ride they're having with this horse. It was a super effort. I, I love watching Morris McKendry, Greg. I've always just loved watching him. He's he is the magic man to watch yeah. when he just gets the best out of these horses and he, he drives good horses with such confidence that they get the results. He's a big chance of getting two group ones on Sunday in the sulky. Proper filly. Such a good effort. She's gone 156.4 on the ultimate race book. Now, trotters don't often go any quicker than 157. Barrier number two is an okay spot, I think, for her. A lot of the action could potentially be on the pegs in this particular race. She's a winning chance, and, and she's a strong winning chance, Greg. Just back to the other race with Highgrove and Hot to Trot. I don't think there's too much between the two. One thing I would say about Hot to Trot, and I'm going to be very, well, not forgiving of him, but I'm going to give him a plenty of leeway in terms of improvement. He hadn't really had a race day run for a month. He went to the races twice in between the Hambletonian and last weekend, and he galloped both times. So his fitness should improve tenfold off that run, and he wasn't beaten far doing all of the donkey work for Highgrove to come off his back. Highgrove's in a bit of a tricky spot, 2,600 for a horse who can get a little bit revvy, does follow out a gate speed horse, which is certainly going to help him, but no, I wouldn't say there's too much between Highgrove and Hot to Trot. Hot to Trot's a really progressive horse, and with his gate speed off the inside, it'll be interesting to see what they do if he did lead to the first corner and Highgrove can't get off. Do they then try and pocket him three back the inside, or do they chance their arm and think that they can outstay him and that he won't be able to come off his back? Such an intriguing race, Greg. I think just about one of the races of the day. Hidden talent doesn't lose any admirers last time out. And the big question mark of the race, I guess, is double delight. She obviously galloped in behind the gate the other day. It wasn't her fault. 
I don't know if she trotted 100% after that, whether she got herself a little bit stirred up and behind the arm, but I don't want to say she's the forgotten horse, Greg, but how could you forget a group one winner? But she's got a fair bit of work to do in terms of her second row draw, and the question could be where's her confidence at after last week? Yeah, that second gallop certainly uh, didn't encourage me anyway, but... The chances don't end there, Matthew, as we look at the market. So we see four fifty for Hot to Trot, $5 con Grazia Love. Favourite is Highgrove three eighty. But the other one that's in the market, and I know you are very keen on, is well-named, masterly. Paul Nairn uh, from the outside draw hasn't had the preparation that most have had taking on uh, you know, their own age group. Um, but you think he can win? Well, he's unorthodox. Is one Paul Nairn. Have a look at his run from Geraldine on Saturday, Greg. He's been beaten by a horse who ran second in the Dominion last year and a horse who ran fourth in the Dominion this year, Matadiros and Ardy by the Hill. He's led them up. And what I enjoyed about his Geraldine run was he trotted a lot better than what he did at Timaru. Just I don't think he was quite 100% at Timaru, but his run at Geraldine was very, very good. He's beaten these horses fair and square before, particularly when he can go forward. Now, with Hot to Trot drawn barrier one, Highgrove on his back, if Highgrove can't get out, Masterly comes looking, do they hand? They could be one, two, three, the pegs. And the way that Masterly ran the other day, he's a strong winning chance. Blinds off, sliding blinds on him up to the 2,600. And he's more proven than just about anything else in the field over the longer trips, Greg. I think he's a really genuine stayer. And the price that they put up, I think, is very, very shoppable. I think one of Masterly, Hot to Trot or Highgrove will win the race. Congrats, you love Double Delight not too far behind, somewhere around those and you, and you won't be too far away. Just about the race of the day for mine, Greg. Yeah, great contest. Really looking forward to it. Uh, it's about the 79th running of this excellent race. And when you think about the Five Wise Men's and Mark Cooler's uh, Speeding Spur, Habibdi, those types of horses have won it in the last 10 years. So you've got to be very, very good to be winning that. Continuing on with our preview and moving away <coughs> from the age group races, uh, here is a change. And, of course, it is the Livermore New Zealand Trotting Free For All. First time it's been run on this date. Here's the latest clash between Sunday Sun, who has an injury and is no longer in the race, but Muscle Mountain went so close. Uh, gee, he's got to be—he's got to be very, very hard to beat Matthew on this performance from the inside barrier, and he's come up with a very short quote from the bookies. Uh, this is, in many ways, his race to lose. Oh, it just makes you hairs on the back of your neck stand up just watching that, doesn't it? Uh, that battle on show day. It, it is his race to lose, to be fair, Greg. And I guess the question would be, as much as we could talk about how good a horse Muscle Mountain is, the people who watch your show obviously know that. And drawn barrier one, he should be able to lead and win the race. So how do we make money outside of Muscle Mountain? The dollar dollar thirty. well, that's not my sort of price, Greg. One horse who's got one of the most emphatic sprint records, particularly at the Addington Raceway of the 1980s, Enheim. And you're getting $3.80 for him to run a drum. I think that's some of the best shopping in the race. Both him and Oscar Bonavina are short course specialists, as we know. Enheim, obviously, wasn't anywhere to be seen uh, during Cup Week. But back to the 1980 Mobile. How's this for a stat, Greg? He's had 11 starts over 1980. He's won 10 of them. He's three dollars eighty to run a place. That'd be where I'd be having a look, Greg. It'll be a good race for the miners, I think. But Muscle Mountain, it does look his race to lose. Yeah, it is dollar thirty for him. Second favourite is Majestic Man. He's come up eight dollars. Then you're out to Oscar Bonavina eleven. Uh, obviously, Enheim twenty one dollars and Five Wise Men, who's really stepped up to this grade, hasn't he? This time in, uh, he's around about $11. Cracking contest, the Livermore New Zealand trotting free-for-all, the eighth on this big, big programme on Sunday. All right, uh, we're going to take a short break on uh, your box seat. On the other side, we'll catch up with a man in very much in form and Zachary Butcher and then preview the Aces. <laughs> Eight drives, four wins, three seconds, all favourites. Mm. <laughs> Couldn't beat that best, could you? 
Honestly, if I was any good, I should have won seven. But uh, no, they all went super. It was a, a night that you got to enjoy. So four winners. Hopefully one day I can get five on a car. But yeah, I'll, I'll be happy and enjoy the four. One of the special wins, uh, the Ray Green team. Obviously, Ray going through a pretty tough time at the moment. But um, yeah, nice, nice to, to grab a win for, for the stable. And yeah, how is the... the the mad professor, as I refer to him as. Yeah, well, I think he's pretty keen to get out of that hospital bed and get back to work, to be honest. But uh, we've got to keep the man down. He's um, Look, it wasn't real good, was it? You know, it's a bloody shame. But, uh, you know, Ray's tough. You know, he's resilient. He'll he'll bounce back. Um, not not as quick as he'd like to, I don't think. You know, with those sort of injuries, you really got to take your time and let the body tell you when you are ready. So hopefully uh, over the next sort of five to ten days, he, he picks up a wee bit and things come right. But still ringing Drake every morning and telling tell the boys what to do, so he must be doing pretty well. Yeah, the Lincoln Farms team, they'll all be rallying around and um, you know, the horses will be well looked after and yeah, I'm sure Ray is giving those instructions. Yeah, it's like anything, you know, when someone has a bit of misfortune like that, you all come together and you make sure the job gets done. So like you said, it was nice to get that win from last night and got a couple of nice ones flying up, so there should be a few more for him to watch in the hospital bed. He's an awesome talent, is Zachary Butcher. Matthew, he's awesome talent as well when it comes to uh, the media side of things. And, um, yeah, he can't quite get the high five on a race day, but, gee, he's gone close a few times, and he's driving in superb form. Yeah, he absolutely is, Greg, and the stats back that up. If you go back over the last five years of Zachary Butcher's career, he's winning one in every six races, which is... I don't know that too many people would ever have a strike rate that good. One in six is just phenomenal. If you're winning one in ten, you're going well. But one in six over the last five years is just super. He, he's a man who doesn't lack in confidence, and I think that shows in his race day driving. And since he's been coming down here to the south as well, he, he's got a lot of fans and followers down here, and he's been picking up the wins as well. He's the punter's friend, Greg. One in six is a pretty good strike rate. I'd say that if you're backing most of his horses, you wouldn't be far away from making a dollar. Part of that interview was about Ray Green. I see a nice touch during the week. Uh, IRT, Richard Cole and the team giving him a uh, photo of, uh, of course, uh, the cup-winning performances of Copy That over the last two years. So um, that would have perked him up as uh, well. So get well soon, uh, Ray. We're looking forward to seeing you back on track and, of course, seeing Copy That very soon. All right, let's start looking at these two-year-old races on Sunday. And with Brick and Farms, uh, appropriately, the first one we have a look at is the Star Philly. This is high energy doing the business in the Lone Star Sire Stakes two-year-old championship. On the other side, the man who puts the syndicates together, along with his wife Karen, Ken Brecken, on how things are going with this filly and building to the sales. High energy, too good, beat confessional, gold bully and late for third and then Helberg. Ken, group two success in the Lone Star. Gee, she's a smart filly this. Yeah, look, she is, Greg. Uh, look, tonight we probably weren't expecting too much. She's had an operation just three or four weeks ago, but, um, you know, she's bred impeccably and showed her true colours tonight, and, uh, look, we are just over the moon. We just probably never quite expected it tonight, but uh, national record to boot um, probably shows how good she is. Yeah, Mum won it as well, Highgate. This family that you've had such great success with and the Super 6 Syndicate. Yes, indeed, you know, we, we had a high gate, and it goes back to, we've got to thank Gene Feast, because we bought Regal Volo look, some years ago, and we've had a huge amount of fun uh, with the progeny of her, and uh, she just keeps delivering, and uh, she's, she's just had another colt. Uh, she had one over there, Triumph Stride, that ran fourth in the Breeders' Ground, and probably a little bit unlucky, so um, she just keeps uh, breeding these horses that are going to top level, and it's just... It just, it's just great. Yep. You've had a great run, the Brick and Farms team, in the last couple of weeks. I think you've bred about four at, uh, at Timaru, including the Cup well, All-American Lover, and, and I think you've had about six or seven for the week. So good time to be doing it, given the sales aren't far away. No, Greg, you mean a bit light. We've actually had her win tonight's actually eight in a row yep. in New Zealand. So uh, it's a great feat, and I think Nigel Fay is th thoroughly enjoying the ride and the, and the staff there. Uh, they, they watch them every week, every day. They, they've, uh, they're all part of our, our successful team and uh, a lot of the credit can be you know, given to them. They do a great job on the farm. All right. 36 yearlings, all Brick and Farms branded this year. A record for you guys. How excited, including, I think you've got a colt that's pretty closely related to this one. Yes, no, we have a full brother yep. and uh, an outstanding looker, so uh, very exciting with him. Um, and we look forward to the trotters. I think the trotters overall last year at the sales, I, no one could uh, put their finger on it, but the sales overall for trotters were disappointing. 
Um, from what I'm hearing, New Zealand Bloodstock are saying they're getting more inquiries than they've probably ever had for trotters. So look, I'd like to think for the trotting breeders out there, look, it might be uh, our day in the sun next year for them. So uh, no, I, think, I think it's exciting. For us, 36, uh, I think which is very good, we've actually got 23 colts. And uh, look, they're probably the best we've ever had. I say it every year, but uh, look, I think we've lifted the bar again. Uh, you know, we've got a mixture of betters to like, Captain Treacherous, you know, the top stallions uh, and the trotting. Uh, Father Patrick, you know, I've stood by a Neverly R stud. I, I really liked the horse in America. He was a fantastic uh, horse on the track. Uh, he also bred Greenshoe over there, which are doing a great job stud-wise. So I think what was very special tonight for them, because these studs invest a lot of money, and, and for them tonight, the first four placings were Father Patrick. So uh, um, it's, it's just wonderful for them as well to get, the, get good runs on the board. He's deeply into it, isn't he? Uh, Ken Breck and Matthew, outstanding jacket he had on there on Friday night as well. And the Super 6 Syndicate are certainly enjoying uh, their luck of running at the moment. And the way High Energy, that minor throat operation she had, um, she can only improve going into this week. And I think the bookies have given you a bit of a leg up here at $1.75. I agree, Greg. Uh, she's one of the bits of the day. I, I think $1.75 might shorten in a little bit. She's got some real sass about her. After the line, she wanted to duck out the gate and have a bit of a look around, and she can be a bit of a handful from all the reports, high energy, but what she is is she's fast. She's very willing. Front row barrier draw really suit. Beat up the boys last time out so that the form should well and truly stack up. Two dangers, Greg. Kiss and run drawn the second row. I was really impressed with her effort beating home Sigrid last time out, who went on to run in the New Zealand Oaks and, and ran a cracker there. So she could be a danger. And the Graham Rogers and Dylan Ferguson trained, she's Bella. She's another one who's been able to beat the boys up in the north. If she were to put it all together, then I'm sure that she wouldn't be too far away. And we see the return of Aroha Kenny Greg back from Australia. And I've got some news here from the stewards as well regarding driver Brad Williamson. The stewards have been asked a few questions as to how Brad is able to drive with his suspension over there in Australia. Now, I'll just go through the information. So Brad faced two charges. The first of those was for careless driving, which was two weeks. So he was suspended for two weeks. That ends on Saturday at midnight. The second charge was where the stewards questioned the tactics of his drive, and he was suspended for five weeks. Now, that was to begin on Saturday at midnight, so they were to run concurrently. What has happened is that Brad has appealed, and he's been granted a stay of proceedings for the second charge. Given the backlog of appeals in Victoria, he is able to drive until further notice until that appeal is heard. So that is the reason why uh, Brad is able to drive with those suspensions. So he's completed this first one, and then the second one he has appealed. And it'll be interesting to see how she goes, Aroha Kenny. She's a, a pretty smart filly on her day, and she's been proven at the Addington Raceway as well. So I certainly wouldn't discount her. No, not at all. The Canterbury Spa and uh, Pool Ace of Hearts. Let's have a look at the market for it. So $1.75 uh, high energy, $5 kiss and run. If you like Aroha Kenny, getting around $10. Luby Lou, $13. Uh, and then you're out to $18 walking on sunshine. Of course, she's Bella, uh, who you mentioned, Matthew, at $7. Has come up with a beautiful barrier draw. So both of us pretty keen there on high energy. And I can see her price rolling in. So let's go to the first of our juvenile trotting uh, features to race number two now, which is for the boys. And the market for this, Matthew, uh, has gold bullion, $1.85. Very unlucky last time in that race behind high energy. Then you're out to $5.50 confessional, who was nothing short of outstanding. Then $9 Hellberg comes up with a nice barrier draw of one and it's stable mate Southern Diamond at $11. Gold Bullion was back on the inside, Matthew. Not really where you wanted him to be. Three back, took on age to get out and going. High energy had got the momentum up at that stage and he really found the line strongly. Don't think Bob Butt will be looking to be unlucky this time. Really found the line, didn't he? Gold bullion. And, and bearing in mind in comparison to confessional. Now, confessional on the ultimate race book, his sectionals were good. 158.9, 58.6, 6, 28.6. Now, he's a very good horse, confessional. And his closing sectionals were faster than gold bullion. But you have to bear in mind that gold bullion has absorbed about two lengths more pressure. So that's about 10, 
uh, two seconds, which is about 10 lengths more pressure through the first 400 metres of the race. And gold bullion was probably as strong to the line as what confessional uh, was. So I'm going to sway with gold bullion as a winning chance in the race. He was so good when he was able to sit parked and beat confessional two starts ago. Um, outside of that, Greg, I thought flying without wings was good, winning its maiden on Sunday. Whether it might be a little bit too soon, Group 1 company for him, but he's clearly got an, a motor. Halberg drawn barrier number one. He'll keep trucking all day. Good swing and barrier draws for him. And I thought what's wanted was pretty good to the line there on the two-year-old race last time out as well. His closing sectionals were good, were just about the best of the race, 57.8 and 28.3 on the way home on the Ultimate race book. So you have to respect him as well in terms of the try factor and first four player but I, I think quite comfortably Greg Gold Bullion deserves all of the respect as the favourite and I'd be happy to back him. Yeah I think he'll be very very hard to beat and again $1.85 I thought was pretty fair from the bookmakers and a big thank you to them getting them out nice and early on this Wednesday morning to allow us to have a look at those. Alright sticking with our aces let's go back to show day and the winning performance of Millwood Nike <laughs> She was outstanding. That's her getting into the clear. Kalua flyby in front. And, of course, uh, the Telford team running second through to fifth. But she just exploded. Uh, look, she's unbeaten in seven from seven. Her overall mile rate on a windy day, 154.7, was uh, outstanding. And uh, Matthew, she's come up with a beautiful barrier draw of uh, two. She's come up a $1.20 favourite. And... I think Mark Purden doesn't necessarily have to press the go button early here because he's in the running line, he's on the best horse, and therefore that's going to make her extremely hard to stop. Yeah, well, you've got Steve and Amanda Telford runners drawn one, four, five, six, and seven. So I would say that as a collective, they won't be wanting to all be settling in behind Melbourne Nike. So there's likely going to be the pressure. Kalua Flyby is the logical horse that you would anticipate that will go forward. And I think you're right, Mark Purden will just posse up early, allow them to go and sort their order out. And I'm not entirely sure that it matters where she sits in the run, Melwood Nike. Her stride, I'd love to go on Stride Master and measure her stride length, actually, Greg, because I think it would be phenomenal. She just floats over the ground, covers it so comfortably. She can stay, she can sprint, she's very willing. I think she'll be eight from eight. The logical danger would be Kalua Flyby, who deserves to get a Group 1 victory on the board. And... The run of Forever Me on Sunday at Addington was very good, and Blair Orange takes the driver aboard her. She was 154.9 on the Ultimate race book, and comes up with a much better barrier draw. So in terms of playing around Quinellas and Trifectas, if you think Millwood Nike is over the line, I think if you shop around, the horse are drawn 4, 5, and 6. Artie by the seaside, Kalua Flyby, and Forever Me, you might not be too far away. Was there anything else in there, Greg, that you saw as maybe blowing out Millwood Nike, or is it as simple as her just rolling around and winning? Oh, I think it's her race to lose, no doubt, but it might not just be as straightforward as lobbing to the front, as I mentioned before. To speak to Blair Orange about Forever Me, he said, yeah, really nice feel, absolutely charged to the line. So I think a lot of people, Matthew, are going to have to play exotics, and there'll be a whole lot of uh, options for you at tab.co.nz. But, you know, around your first fours and behind these hot favourites, uh, horses like Forever Me, definite chance. Kalua Flyby will go forward. I reckon if it leads, and, and Millwood Nike even comes and sits outside it, I think it's a lot Quinella for mine. Uh, the question mark horses out of the race, Love Struck, she's been extremely disappointing, as she was again on Sunday, uh, not really living up to her rap. And Treacherous Gal's got to be some sort of first four hope. Punches out behind Millwood Nike, and we know that she has a strong finishing burst. She was able to run down Artie by the seaside a couple of starts back, and uh, if she reproduced that sort of run, she would be able to uh, to get herself into the first four. But really, <coughs> it is Millwood Nike uh, the hardest to beat. <coughs> Excuse me, in that one for sure. That one's with Avon City Ford. Uh, the next one we want to have a look at uh, is the Crossing Ace of Spades. Good contest this as well. Uh, this is last Sunday, Matthew. Sherlock in front and... The ace is all in, two-year-old it was, a charging late finish from Charlie Brown. He really uh, has uh, hit the line strongly here, but, well, Sherlock was unlucky in the size stakes with Woodlands on Cup Day. He's come up with a perfect barrier draw, you would think, this week uh, from barrier one, and that tick-over run, if you like, on Sunday should have him at fever pitch going into the group one.
He's a quirky horse. You see him in the prelim, Greg, and he's, he's all over the show. He's looking around and he can be a bit of a handful. Then he sort of switches on and, and come the race, he, he's obviously very good. I think Don't Stop Dreaming's a better horse, but what Sherlock has got is the gate speed to hold up and dictate the race. And I don't know that Natalie Rasmussen will particularly roll forward and then try and back them off. I would say she'll just keep running. And if he's running... 220, 221. If it's a nice hot day, home in 55, it makes it awfully hard for Don't Stop Dreaming mathematically to pick him up. I, and I think that's the thing that's a, that is against Don't Stop Dreaming is the maths of the race. If he were to settle in the middle half or the back half of the field, having to come around and then trying to out-sprint a horse who's going to be covering less ground. So I'm going to sway with Sherlock as the winning hope in the race, Greg. Ability-wise, Don't Stop Dreaming, I think, is better, but does just have a little bit of work to do. Da Vinci's going to be in the logical spot to be running Quinella's trifectas in first fours on the back of Sherlock if he were to lead the race. And then you've got Charlie Brown and Ulta Meteor, probably not too much between them, but they could potentially be going back and trying to cover extra ground as well. I thought Sherlock, maybe a, a slight amount of overs in the market too, Greg, 210. I, I would think he might start somewhere closer to that dollar eighty mark, particularly with the, with the All-Stars factor. I thought he'd lead, try and lead throughout, and, and therefore he's hard to roll. Yeah, absolutely. And he's already moved, Matthew. 210 now into $1.90 virtually in the first couple of minutes of betting. So he's $1.90 as we look at the market now. Off the front row, Ulta Meteors, $9. Uh, and then, of course, Don't Stop Dreaming, the size stakes winner at $2.70. You're right about Da Vinci, drawn to get the perfect run. And again, if you're playing top three, top four, particularly top four with him, uh, you, you're certainly playing uh, into a nice option there. TAB.co.nz for all of those exotic bets. And uh, that's a wrap on the eight Group 1 races, uh, Matthew. Before we get to the East West Fencing uh, Summer Cup, OK, so you're looking at all the odds now. You've had a chance to peruse them. Is it a case of picking out your top three bets and multiing them up? Because um, that would seem the logical way to go. I think it is, Greg. You, you Obviously, you're either spending a big pool and you're taking horses like uh, Millwood, Nike, Mud Confidence. I think the price around High Energy and, and Sherlock, they're both worth throwing into some early multis if you're taking those, Greg. I think High Energy maybe starts closer to $1.60. Sherlock will move as well. So those two would be happy to probably multi them up. Look, Greg, outside of that, I think one horse that I would be happy to back is Lady of the Light. I, I don't think that it is just a handed race to true fantasy, so maybe early doors would be having a little bit of a nibble on her as well. All right, let's go to the final... Uh, sorry, thank you, Matthew, for that. Uh, to the final race on the programme, and it is the free-for-all. It's with East West Fencing. Uh, Paul Smith and the team getting behind this race, and... Here's the New Zealand free-for-all, Matthew, the key lead-up to this in so many ways. Self-assured gets home, gets home really nicely. He's a sports hard held in behind them. Uh, BD Joe directly behind him, now looking to angle out, doesn't get into the clear and spank him on his outside. Uh, Majestic Cruiser, who's been punching around in the Inter-Dominions, which we'll touch on very shortly, uh, goes down a short margin. But self-assured in this sort of form, uh, it's a free-for-all, but it's a pref barrier draw, and therefore rated at 120. He comes up with the outside uh, draw. Uh, spank him to his inside. Both of them, well, one's at 1.9 million and one's hovering around that mark. Uh, two great performers for the All-Stars over the years. But I know you're going to probably say to me, this could be BD Joe's race to lose. He's got the barrier draw advantage coming out of the six. He had no luck over the cup meeting. He's a go-forward horse. He's led in one of Harness Jewels in front beating Krug, who's drawn to his outside. Tim Williams takes the reins. I spoke to him. He said, I'm, I'm expecting a pretty positive drive. Uh, well, I'm going to be positive anyway. These horses all leading towards the Invercargill Cup, Matthew, but I think then the, the, the residual fitness that they're going to have from Cup Week should ensure that they're not far off it. It's good. Perfect lead up. 13 days until the Invercargill Cup. That's just the perfect timing, I think, for these horses to have a nice sprinting run that won't flatten them, should bring them on. They can keep them up to the mark for the next two weeks. So I'm with you with BD Joe. I think that he can roll forward and dictate the race. He's very fast off the arm, and these races often, Greg, that we see on pegs in front is going to be the place to be, and self-assured might have to be running a 53 half to beat him coming from behind. Be interested to see what happens with horses like Cranbourne, whether he's got enough hustle and bustle early to get out and, and try and hold a spot. I'm not entirely sure that he will. So 
Beatty Joe might be able to clear them early. They won't mess around around the first corner. Just keep on rolling. He can run 218, 219 on his ear, Beatty Joe, home in 55, which makes it too hard, Greg, mathematically for horses who are even one off the fence to beat a class act like he is. He really bounced off the cup, didn't he? I thought the cup might have flattened him a little bit, but then he's come into the free-for-all and he's been even better. So as long as he hasn't lost any fitness within the sort of three and a half weeks, then I think he can go close to winning, Greg. He's my bet of the day, BD Joe. I think he'll lead and win the last. All right, that's uh, great to know. You have to wait to the last, but there's so many other betting options leading into that. But BD Joe, best bet for Matthew Cross. The first race on Sunday, 12.15. It's a gold coin donation. The weather report is excellent. Absolutely no reason why you shouldn't head out to Addington Raceway. Uh, eight Group 1s on the programme and some of the best harness horse flesh in the land and one of the great race days I'm sure it is going to be on Sunday. Well done to Harness Race New Zealand and of course Addington Raceway, the Met there. They'll put on a day to be remembered and uh, looking forward to being part of the action there on Sunday as I'm sure Matthew is. Continuing on with your box seat brought to you by our stable of sponsors, the Inter Dominion is underway and of course in the trotting ranks uh, we have some ownership involved in, in the pacing ranks but in the trotting ranks uh, Bolt for Brilliance uh, was excellent on night one we'll show you that and talk about his second night run shortly Matthew but uh, gee in this sort of form there were question marks everyone thought Majestuoso would lead but Tony Hurler he just didn't even listen to this uh, that rather with Garrards of course great supporters uh, of the show and well he was simply too good on night one. Night two, things didn't go as well, Matthew. A broken cord meant only one earplug came out um, and uh, there were uh, lock wheels about the 400 metres. He did charge home behind nephew of Sunoco, but uh, all importantly, Matt, he picked up points to ensure that he's in the grand final. He's come up with barrier two on the last night at Geelong. Uh, so he's trucking along nicely, thanks very much. Well, the best thing about winning your first heat is basically all of the pressure comes off. You've only really got to run well between then and the final. So, look, it's, it's not really anything to get too fussed about the fact that he got beaten last night. He was still incredibly good, and had he not locked wheels around the corner, probably wins the race quite comfortably. I love how he just quickened up off the bend there at Tadcourt Park Melton on, on Saturday as well. He's a grouse, good-doing horse. He's older now so he's certainly going to handle the campaign and look out when he gets up over the longer trip Greg I, I know that we're probably a touch biased as Bolt for Brilliance fans but I don't see too many horses giving him too much bother there in the final. I just believe has been unbeaten of course in a couple uh, and uh, Queen Elida who is uh, owned here in New Zealand by the McKenzies and of course uh, Tony and Cheryl Barron uh, also winning on uh, night two so yeah it's going to be really interesting uh, on Saturday night uh, barrier one just believe or make believe and of course um, we have Bolt for Brilliance in two so that's going to be the most intriguing there. From a pacing point of view, Mac Dan winning last night, uh, back in winning form. Spirit of St. Louis, somewhat controversial, uh, that decision, because there was a stewards inquiry into that heat, uh, beyond delight being pushed a bit wider on the track. And Onalua Bay remains unbeaten, having won two from two. So, uh, yeah. Excellent uh, into Dominion. Next week we'll get Michael Guerin to preview those finals for us. But uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing that clash between Just Believe uh, and Bolt for Brilliance there on Saturday night. That'll probably determine who's favourite for the final. All right, more on the Inter Dominion uh, next week. But as we go to a break, it's always a special time. Uh, winning your first race as a driver and Daniel Anderson achieved that last week. Super fast superstar coming after him. So is Hot Saucy Betty Action Pack. They're going to tease Mike Tartan up in the centre. Super fast superstar, I think. Super fast superstar. And that'll be Dan Anderson's first winning drive. Well done.
So here's win number one, training-wise for Tom Bamford. Muscle Bank getting the job done there at Geraldine on a great day for them. I'll touch on that more in a moment, but a real milestone uh, for Tom. He's liked around uh, the stables and around the industry and uh, getting win number one by about eight lengths there. And Yeah, pretty happy to do it for him was uh, Gavin Smith. Good on you, Tom. Win number one with Muscle Bank. Uh, also significant on the day, Mark Jones getting win number 700, Matthew, with the Coleman, the little horse who tries very hard. And yeah, Mark's had an incredible training career and yeah, 700 wins is racked up pretty quickly. Yeah, one of our great drivers, of course, and uh, knocked on the door for the 700 for a couple of weeks would have been a little bit frustrating, but he's a neat horse, the Coleman. I can't believe what he paid. He was about $8, Greg, for a horse who really relishes the standing starts. And yeah, they're not without a chance. The Iverport Lodge team of picking up a group one on Sunday either with Hot to Trot, who will be vastly improved with a couple of runs in between. So good luck to them, and I'm sure that the 800 won't be too far away either. And a big uh, week, of course, for Michelle Wallace and Bernie Hackett. Uh, Bernie getting to 400, Michelle getting to 600 when Icy Fire was winning too. Uh, speaking mm. of the North, on Friday night at Alexandra Park, this horse, Hay Bar Tender, takes on the Superior Cabins Franklin Country Cup. Uh, they raced for 20,000. He did set bolted in here. Uh, look, he was way too good off the mobile. Goes back to a stand. It's been somewhat of a, a tricky situation for him thus far, but he's getting better, and he's off the unruly off the 10 metres, so I'm sure James will give him every chance. Last tango in heaven, and of course Hot and Treacherous starting off uh, 45 metres in that one. It's also Akaroa Cup Day on uh, Saturday, leading into the Grand Prix, and here's Homebush Lad winning at Geraldine last week for the Hopes and Ben. Uh, they turned over about 1.2 million, uh, Matthew, pretty good effort on a Saturday on trackside too, but Homebush Lad punches round at all these country cups, goes great races, and he went another cracking one here, beating Coral Valley star. He could have been a wee bit more if it was on a Sunday too, Greg, to be fair. Homebush Lad and uh, Coral Valley star and Chell Patch all just proving that the peg's the place to be, particularly when you've got, <coughs> excuse me, horses that are starting off 20 metre handicap. So just can't get into the race, Greg. It's that simple. And when you're betting into these races, it's not too hard to work out, particularly on the grass tracks that if you're drawn out the back, You've got horses like Homebush Lad and, and Chell Patch and Coral Valley Star are all drawn to get good runs on the pegs. The other horses that you back. He's been such a, a handy horse for quite a while, uh, Homebush Lad. He's off a handicap, of course, on Saturday in the Akaroa Cup, as well as Coral Valley Star. So we might be swaying to potentially some others to uh, beat those. Coral Valley Star, good to see him get his confidence back after a couple of OK efforts recently. And uh, Chell Patch, yeah, he's worth following Chell Patch. I think he's a real genuine sort of intermediate, maybe even higher sort of horse that's proven at the Addington Raceway as well, doing work. So a nice finish there. And yeah, always good to see uh, the hopes do the business and be a little bit more pressure on them come Sunday and the trotting free-for-all, I'm sure. Yep, they sure will be. Uh, let's have a look at where you can go harness racing around uh, the week. Kicking off here with uh, Cambridge. They have an eight-race card on Thursday night. 5.56 is the first there. Just a half a dozen. Bit of a concern horse numbers-wise again. 7.16, so a later start. And the Superior Cabins Franklin Country Cup is the feature. Earlier in the day, week or two, we have a 10-race programme there. 3.50 the start time. Jason Broad actually has gone for race two, number one, Warrior Easton, just to uh, get involved in their Akaroa Cup there on Saturday and the massive day on Sunday. Eight Group 1s, 12.15 the start of the 10 race programme. Uh, the best bets of the week with hand milking. Uh, Mota Carrara, race 11, number 2, Magic Dash is where... Uh, Graham Hand has gone into Muscle Mountain, so that's his multi. Michael Guerin's actually Cambridge Race 5, number 6, Village Rebel, and I've gone for high energy, so uh, we'll be malting them up for breast cancer, but your best bet? Yeah, I like your high energy, $1.75, that won't hold up. BD Joe for me, Greg, last race on the programme, we'll wait till the last, you're only as good as your last tip, so I might be going home with my tail between my legs, but I think he'll lead and win the East-West Fencing Summer Cup at Group 3. Should be a fantastic uh, day, Greg. Like I said to you at the start of the show, it's all kind of crept up on us, so probably haven't had too much time to kind of sit there and get all worried about what's going to happen. But, yeah, I think there'll be a real enjoyment factor about watching some 
really good, honest horse racing there on Sunday. Yeah, can't wait for it, uh, Matthew. Thank you so much for your input today. Just on the Invercargill Cup, great news coming through that it will be a handicap. And, gee, they're going to be uh, in, inundated with some quality horses, the likes of Self-Assured, Spankham, uh, BD Joe, and a few more to boot. That's been your box seat. Uh, really appreciate Matthew Cross's input. And uh, we'll have him back next week to review all of that, preview the Inter-Dominion, and we will see you in seven days' time. The Box Seat, brought to you by our stable of sponsors. Harness Link, for your worldwide harness coverage. New Zealand Bloodstock Standard Bread, where winning begins. Brecon Farms, Stonewall Stud. IRT, it's your horse and our passion. Australasian wide Garrard's Horse and Hound. Ringwick Farms, Lincoln Farms, Harness Racing New Zealand, and the clubs Addington Ashburton, Alexandra Park and Cambridge.